Quick intro for myself, my name is Shane Kehoe. I am one of the co-founders of a firm based here in London called SVK Crypto. SVK Crypto is a venture capital firm which invests into very early stage blockchain technology companies. Um, we are seed investors, we take equity stakes. Um, the last major hurdle with SVK Crypto is we have partnered up with Block One. Some of you may know who Block One is or may not. They are creator of the EOS token, and Block One raised over $4.8 billion without a Morgan Stanley or a Goldman Sachs um, or any other investment bank. They did it all by themselves by holding the largest token generation event in history. They've taken a billion dollars of that capital, and they've partnered up with five venture capital firms around the world, of which we are. Uh, we are serious as a heart attack about what we do. We eat, sleep, and breathe crypto. Uh, we have uh, our fund uh, since inception of two years ago. We really realized it was all about the community and building a community driven approach because, in order to have adoption, in order to, to really see this space develop, um, it's going to be the community that's going to be driving it. It's not about writing a check. No one really gives a shit. Everyone's got money. It matters about the community that you have. And I think when we start to see more institutional capital come in, because I was a partner at a hedge fund for 15 years prior to this, it's not going to be about a cornerstone, or it's not going to be about writing the check. It's going to be what can you add to the community and what can you add to the project. So um, I'm passionate to the point of unhealthiness, and I'm either going to be really right or really wrong, but uh, the future looks like it's, uh, it's going to work out just perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Uh, my name is Lucas Chris. I'm head of business development uh, for Cumberland in Europe. Uh, Cumberland is the leading global liquidity provider in crypto. Uh, we are the largest market maker globally, uh, primarily focused on the OTC market. Uh, we also make markets electronically on exchanges as well. Uh, we do a number of other things. We're a subsidiary of DRW. DRW is a large uh, proprietary trading firm. We have about 900 folks globally, nine offices. Um, Cumberland, uh, we trade 24 seven in about uh, 40 different crypto assets. Um, across offices in Chicago, London, Singapore, and Tokyo. And um, that's, that's coming up. Um, my, my name is Nick Niedermother. Um, I'm, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm maybe I'll start the other way around. Um, academically, um, I used to be a number theorist. Um, so I was relatively close to, to cryptography, and that's probably one of the uh, reasons why um, blockchain uh, caught my eye quite a number of years ago already. But um, professionally, I actually, after university, um, moved into power and gas uh, trading. So I was a derivatives trader for a number of years. Um, and then about two years ago, I, I took the plunge uh, and set up um, a small kind of market making business um, for crypto exchanges. Um, and then a year ago, I um, teamed up with a co founder um, and we set up Prime Factor Capital, um, which is a crypto asset manager. And uh, we're just in the process of uh, launching our first strategy. Great. Thank you. My name is uh, Michael Lee. I'm head of crypto trading at FlowTraders. FlowTraders is a leading global liquidity provider in financial markets, um, specialized in ETFs, but also obviously uh, in cryptocurrencies. Uh, since 2011, I traded um, in uh, European sector markets in ETFs, and last year I got a chance to uh, start a business in crypto trading, which was a pretty cool opportunity, of course. Um, it is very useful to use the experience as an ETF trader, and um, currently we are quite a big market maker as well in cryptocurrencies. Um, so that's uh, where we're at now. Great, thank you, Michael. I, th I think in order to give value back to the audi audience, it's always good to have questions, audience participation. Um, I think that we're going to go through a series of topics, but if anyone has questions, don't wait till the end. Put up your hand, stand up, introduce yourself, and then that way we can add value back to you guys, and it's a lot more interactive. Um, so listen, guys, why don't I kick this off? Uh, let's talk about the current landscape for institutional investors that are looking to deploy a, pr a proportion of their capital into the space. How do you see this? Sure. So I mean, uh, at Cumberland, we primarily deal with the institutional side, so we trade with uh, a lot of crypto hedge funds, traditional hedge funds, family offices, brokers, etc. Uh, we also deal with a very wide variety of crypto market participants, uh, crypto ecosystem participants, so service providers, miners, ICOs, etc. Uh, so we see a really wide variety of how people are getting involved in this market. Um, largely, the institutional side uh, has been more of a trickle in because of uh, you know existing infrastructure issues. There really is no um, kind of capital markets frameworks wrapped around the crypto market yet. 
Uh, so it makes it quite challenging for institutions to get involved. Uh, that said, we're definitely seeing a lot of that interest. Um, we're seeing a lot of institutions get involved, uh, kind of depending on their level of sophistication with, as, as far as uh, custody and as far as their risk tolerance for um, you know, the operational side of cryptocurrency, uh, which is one of the most difficult challenges. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we're seeing at the moment. Just to clarify, when you're talking about cryptocurrency, um, is there any particular tokens or coins that you're referring to? I know that you guys do a lot of size in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, what are the other coins that you actually trade? Sure, so, so we actually like to refer to them as crypto assets at, at Cumberland. Um, we think that cryptocurrency is kind of a, a too specific of a bucket, but we trade in about 40 different uh, crypto assets. Um, so you know, we see kind of a, a really wide range of you know, more liquid to less liquid coins. Uh, obviously on the institutional side, what we see is, you know, as you would expect, uh, the first involvement is usually it with the more liquid assets, particularly Bitcoin and the derivatives around Bitcoin. So that's, that's kind of what we see. Do, do you get any type of sense from your client base um, how, how you're feeling the market? You're in touch with institutional buyers and sellers. Do you get to feel that they're overall bullish or are they overall bearish? Um, and are they also asking you for any types of short positions as well? Has that been an ongoing conversation? Because that was a product that was brought in later on on some of your some of your assets. Sure, so um, I mean, yeah, I think that one interesting aspect about the institutional side is that, as I said previously, the operational side of managing trading of crypto assets is extremely challenging, and unless you have that expertise and that infrastructure available, um, then it's, it's very hard to operate around that. So we do see uh, a lot of interest uh, on the derivative side, uh, just because they can get exposure to the asset, but they, they don't have to you know, mess with the custody and the operational side of it. Um, I think one interesting stat, the, uh, the, the Grayscale uh, in, in Bitcoin Investment Trust, which is one of the larger uh, Bitcoin funds out of the US that provides uh, kind of synthetic exposure to uh, Bitcoin, uh, they announced, I think just a couple days ago, that they've seen uh, the greatest year-to-date inflows in crypto assets. And I think that that's kind of an indication that um, you know, institutions are getting more involved. And, the interest is there, and, and the way they want to get involved first is through a way that it is fam familiar with them and a way that they don't have to deal with the complicated operational side. So that, uh, you know, something like that allows them to get that exposure. But we do see definitely an increased amount of folks um, becoming more sophisticated and kind of getting up to speed with what it takes to trade the physical crypto assets themselves. Nick, what's your view on the current landscape for institutional investors entering the space? Yeah, I mean, as I think Luke has already alluded to, I think it's, it's still early days, um, and, and a lot of the infrastructure that you would expect isn't there yet. Um, and, you know, I, I think exemplary for that is, is the exchange infrastructure. I mean, most of the trading is happening on exchanges. Um, that, that's where the retail investors um, are, are kind of getting exposure to the space and, and double around with cryptos. But none of these exchanges are regulated, and, you know, maybe in the US, uh, under the bit license kind of framework, there's a few ways now for um, crypto players to get some under some kind of regulatory uh, framework. But it, it really, at this point, um, a lot of the questions are unresolved and cryptos have managed to slip through the net. Um, and if there is regulation, it's only coming through, come in through the back door. So where crypto in the US, for example, is a, is a security, regulators can do something about it. Um, where you have regulated derivatives built on top um, of, of a cryptocurrency like the futures contracts, the regulators can, can come in and do something about the underlying market as well. But overall, um, there are still lots of pockets where no regulation exists, and I think that's really been hampering uh, institutional investment. Right, and I mean, that's very obvious. We're, we're all very pro-regulation. We want to see a framework on how we can actually go about our business and stay compliant. Um, I really think that when you look back at the start of 2017, uh, June, January the 1st, 2017, the total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies were 20 billion at the very start of 2017. By year end, 31st of December, 2017, they were 800 billion. That's a 40X return. At the start of the year 2017, there was not one financial institution or any of the hedge fund guys I work with interested in cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. They thought it was nerd money. They didn't understand it. They didn't know it. They didn't want any part of it. Within 12 months' time, my phone had been ringing off the hook with hedge fund guys wanting to know how they could get in. So the regulator got caught out by that because they didn't think that they would have to regulate. They thought it was just too small and it would go away. It's obviously right now, it's not going back in the box. Technology never does. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a real statement to the fact that 
We're all professional guys working for professional outputs, all looking to, to uh, uh, mature, mature the scene and the investment opportunities. Um, Michael, what do you think yourself? Um, current landscape for institutional investors investing into the space? Yeah, well, as I said before, I think uh, the lack of regulation is, is one of the important things that's missing uh, for the institutional investors, as, and that leads to that, you know, for example, they can't uh, insure, uh, get insurance for the funds. Um, maybe interesting is, I, I think it's very important that um, projects will be introduced that, that uh, investors can trade in like ETFs. Um, so the Bitcoin ETFs, they have been rejected a couple of times by the SEC, um, which has uh, led to quite some downswings. Um, I think because of the importance that the market, market thinks how, um, of how, how uh, the investors can get into the market. Uh, and it's also the lack of um, really the definitely guide, guidelines that they can give um, that prevent investors to get into this market. Uh, they, I think they gave like a self seven page of, of improvements on, on what uh, the Bitcoin ETF should improve to be able to be uh, sort of uh, approved. Um, some things were uh, like uh, surveillance, lack of surveillance and also manipulation issues. Um, those are things that should be addressed and uh, I think before that is also difficult for investors to get in, into these uh, products. I'd be interested to know who in the audience doesn't hold any cryptocurrency, who doesn't have any exposure? Is there a show of hands who doesn't? Is it, is it in your mindset that you want to learn more and that you would like to put on a trade? Or, I mean, do you believe or don't you? It's kind of binary, right? Is there, who, want, who, who intends to buy cryptocurrencies? My man. Uh, okay, uh, is there any questions from the audience or shall we just move on? Yeah, shoot, shout it out. Hey, Danny over here. Um, you guys talked a lot about the custody issues, which might be preventing institutional clients coming to the space. But I was wondering what you thought more around just like how people execute, you know, because I know a lot of OTC trading is done over Skype. So when you go to a big institution, you're like, get into crypto. Oh, how do I execute uh, Skype, Telegram, or WhatsApp? What are your thoughts around that? How can we make that better um, to really unleash that wave? Yeah, it, it, you're, you're spot on. I mean, I think that. When you think about uh, institutional trading tools and other asset classes, uh, it's not Skype chat, it's not Telegram chat, it looks a lot different. Um, I mean, we, we definitely think that that you know, method of trade execution is, is short-lived as this market develops. And so we're building a lot of tools internally actually to deal directly with that. Um, tools that look very familiar to institutional traders uh, and they're gonna be able to access this market in a way that's very familiar to them. Um, you know, as far as the infrastructure, again, you know, custody you mentioned, also, just exchange infrastructure. I mean, there is no such thing as, or hardly, but there's no such thing as latency sensitive trading as it exists in other asset classes. And I think that, um, you know, this is the only asset class maybe ever, but certainly in my lifetime where the price action has completely outpaced any infrastructure development, uh, you know, behind the asset itself. So I think that that is gonna take some time to catch up, but I think, you know, when we look at this asset class in three to five years, seven years, 10 years, um, I am, I'm pretty confident it's gonna look like every other asset class, and I think that's gonna be similar for the tools that are, that are used to trade in. Um, I think for me, there's two sides of the story, right? One is the overall price action, right? And price action, especially in cryptocurrencies, are driven by emotion, right? So what drives emotion? Fear and greed. Fear goes through the market a lot quicker than greed. And we've seen that happening, but that's not interesting to me. The underlying tech, which is going from bottom left to top right, the protocols that are being built out, the solutions, the security, the scalability, the ability for blockchains to be used in enterprises, which will make them transparent, which will have farm to fork recordings of food sources, which will help in logistics, which will help in fractional ownership, which will look after a land registry. That's what my, when I look at this, this is my horizon of where, as a, as a macro trader, I like a story. And the price action on a day-to-day -day basis, and I know that you're on a desk making markets for clients, but for me, it doesn't bother me at all. Because I know that if it goes the way that I think it will, in 10 years' time, everything will have just gone through, through the roof. So price action is noise to me, but the underlying tech is really what you've got to understand what's happening. And when you look at how we're I think back in 1992 of the internet, 
I'm, we're pre-Netscape, we're pre-browser. Like, it's difficult to go and open up an account with an unregulated broker in Singapore. It's a pain in the ass. I think you're making a very good point there in terms of that it's, it's, a, it's tech that's underpinning this asset class. Yeah. And I think if you look at it from that point of view, um, it's actually not quite true that there have been no institutions involved as yet. I mean, well, it depends how you define institution, I guess, but venture capital firms out of the US have been very active in the space for yeah. five years, six years already. Yeah. Um, it's just it's a different mindset to, I guess, the banking sector, which is a lot more regulated. And these guys are used to investments failing, and they're happy to put money into something that, that might not, su not succeed. Um, so, so I think that's simply what you're playing out. And I think the difference to other venture capitalists that really this asset class, it's, it's something that you can trade, and that's why you see all this price action, which is usually hidden in kind of private investments held by venture capital firms, yeah. and that only kind of surfaces a lot later on, uh, for example, in an IPO, and, and when most of the action has already happened, and, uh, and you see kind of just the companies that have survived <coughs> until then. Um, so maybe that's, that's the way of thinking about it as well. Yeah, how do you guys look at it from, from a price action perspective to where we are, to you know, where we've come back to, and, and maybe give me some insight to any of the tech that you guys have kind of seen, and what's kind of interesting you on that side? I mean, to get back on the, like the, the chats that, that's used for OTC trading, I think it's like five years ago, ETFs were traded by telephone, by chats, and by then, ETFs existed for more, more than 10 years. So I think um, development of, of trading, um, goes a lot faster in, in, in the crypto space uh, rather than um, in the crypto compared to like the traditional markets. So um, I don't really see that as a problem. I think uh, it's going actually quite well. What was the question you asked about the price? Yeah, I was just wondering if you had, I mean, you, you guys are flow traders are all proprietary capital, okay? So you live and die by your trade, right? Okay, so I was, I was just trying to get an understanding with how you kind of saw the market and the price action um, I mean, you, you obviously want volatility because that's how you don't want a market just to flatline. I mean, for us, volatility is good, of course. Um, we ourselves don't have any opinion on, on where the Bitcoin price should be going. Um, I mean, I guess it's so, so the downticks, um, I would say there were uh, lots of uh, early Bitcoin adapters uh, selling off everything. And I think now the lack of news is. is making that the, the, the price of Bitcoin has been very stable uh, uh, of the last months, actually. Um, and there are barely, I don't think there are a lot of new uh, flows coming in, um, which is why I think uh, yeah, the, the market's a little bit waiting for, for new, uh, new uh, flows. Um, Nick, you mentioned um, institutional capital coming into the space, and it's something that I've been very aware of for, for several years now. Um, just to kind of give you uh, what's happened recently, um, I suppose Fidelity coming in and looking after custody, they're not doing that because they think it might work, they're doing that because they have interest. Um, Goldman Sachs, I know, have been looking after a synthetic uh, price of, of Bitcoin that they can make to their clients. I know that their clients were approaching Goldman's for them to make a market because it's a lot easier if you had a tier one hedge fund to um, have a risk and compliance sign off if you're dealing with Goldman's because they'll make a syn synthetic product rather than you dealing with um, maybe someone like a Binance. Um, it's a lot easier to get it through your risk committee. So I know Goldman's were building, we're building out that. And we've already seen uh, Brevin Howard, which is one of the larger macro funds here in, in London. Um, Alan Howard has taken some of his own uh, proprietary capital and started Elwood, which is almost like a crypto hedge fund, venture capital fund, risk arb. Um, and they are now deploying um, Alan Howard's own capital into the space. And also, recently, with the company that we're in partnership called Block One, they had a few strategic investors. Uh, they had Peter Thiel from PayPal, uh, they had Alan Howard, and they had Lewis Bacon from More Capital all invest into them. So, I mean, for me, uh, it's quite obvious that institutional money is coming into the space. And it might not be getting headlines, or they might not be coming out. Um, certainly, it's very difficult for hedge funds that have, that have raised capital for equity long, short, or emerging markets. They can't take a proportion of that capital and start buying Bitcoin. They don't have the mandate to do it. But we're starting to see um, the owners of these hedge funds are the desk which would have capital which they can risk um, starting to play the markets. And I think um, when you look at the asset class and you look at you know, where we are in the fixed income market and the property market and the equity markets, um, certainly, if this does take off, uh, if you didn't have exposure in it, 
um, you'd be doing yourself a disservice because you're just going to be left behind. Um, let's talk about uh, Bitcoin futures. Uh, why haven't they taken off? Um, what's your view? Um, how do you think we're going to see other institutional products come into the space? And you know, I, I know you guys at Cumberland as well are always offering different things. What, 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 what's it look like for you, your Bitcoin futures? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I would, I would maybe disagree a little bit in the sense that uh, I mean, if you do look at the launch of the CME and the CBOE futures last year. Um, I mean, the, the liquidity and the volume uh, going through was, was pretty unimpressive. Uh, if you look at it today, I know, um, you know the guys at the CME are actually very pleased with uh, you know, how that product has developed. I think that a number of uh, you know, very large financial institutions are involved in, in, in trading uh, the list of futures. Um, I think the trend's going to continue. As I said earlier, it's the easiest way for people to, you know, institutions to dip their toes in because, you know, it's traded on a regulated exchange. There's no uh, operational issues with, or, you know, operational difficulties with, with trading it. Um, so I, I think it's, it's an avenue that is most easily accessible for institutional folks who are looking to uh, get some exposure to crypto. Um, but I mean, as I said earlier as well, um, the level of sophistication of these firms and their and their capabilities is continu continuing to increase on a on a daily basis, and so um, I think that as people kind of dip their toes in with maybe some of those futures contracts, um, they also kind of you know want to start getting involved in other marketplaces as well, uh, the spot market, uh, other futures markets, uh, unregulated futures markets around the globe on different exchanges. Um, so I think that I think that you know the CME might tell you that. It has it has taken off based on the the growth that they've seen over the last year. I think uh, perhaps if you look if you compare it to spot exchange volume, it hasn't taken off. But I think it kind of depends on what perspective you look at it from. I think it's amazing that they have um, that they have come to the table to try to find a solution. And uh, I think the more products that we have, um, even if they are cash settled, um, it's a start, and uh, it will continue to get better. Mm -hmm. And we're getting a, a physically settled settled future very soon as well for for Bitcoin. Yeah. I think ISA are working on that. I think the space is developing. And, and I think in, in relation to the size of the asset class, the futures have been a success. Um, and yeah, it, it's great to have this tool available, I think, for more institutional players that do want to you know, get rid of this custody issue and, and not take any risks, um, especially if you've got a franchise um, built around you. You, know, you. you don't want to ruin your reputation yeah. by, by, by something going wrong in a relatively small part of your business. Um, so I think it's kind of a natural progression that we will see there over the next few years. Michael, do you trade the futures market at all? Yeah, yeah we trade them. And uh, I think it will be very interesting to see how the, these futures that are physical settled on will take off. Um, maybe there may be some concerns in, in how these uh, futures settle, because uh, there may be manipulation on the exchanges, of course, which are not uh, necessarily regulated. Um, there have been some big private mov movements around these uh, settlements. So that may be one thing that uh, investors might be afraid of. And, and that's something that a fiscal settled future would uh, solve. We just kind of touched on the regulatory environment. Um, I'm interested to know when, when, when you look at, you know, when you look at your day to day business, you're, you are, as we are, approaching it in a regulatory fashion, right? Like as if KYC, AML, I mean, what would you like to see from the regulator? Sure. I mean, I, I think that at DRW, we have over 25 years of experience trading in pretty much every financial market that there is. And so we look at this market just the same as we look at any other market from a regulatory standpoint. So the way we treat trading in these markets is the same way we treat trading in um, you know, the US Treasury bond market, you know, commodities markets, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so we apply what we know and the best practices, and we apply that directly to you know, the crypto markets. I think that you know, we, we are all for regulation of this market. We think that that's, again, it's a barrier to entry for institutions to get involved. And I think that um, you know, the, the right kind of, of regulation is going to allow innovation to occur, but also allow institutions to become a lot more comfortable with getting involved in crypto as an asset class. Nick, uh, you too. I presume that you approach the space in a regulatory fashion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we are basically trying, I mean, we are very much targeting kind of the professional and institutional space, and yep. um, we just have to see when, when they're ready, but we just want to make sure we're there with the right kind of 
vehicles for these type of investments. Um, when, when you're talking to a potential clients or investors, um, certainly from, from where I sit at my desk, I, I think I spend a lot of time uh, educating, bringing, bringing institutional investors up to speed. Um, there's, there's, still quite a, there's still quite a steep learning curve. Uh, do you find that also? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now it's as much about educating investors or people in general about the asset class than it is about trading it or investing in it or, or anything like that. So it's, it's really, it's quite a new thing. It's, it's more technically complex, technologically complex, I think, than other asset classes. Um, so that element is, is definitely there. Um, since we started deploying capital into the space, initially proprietary capital back in 2016, um, I was on a hunt for knowledge, downloaded and read every book that I could get on Amazon and watched everything, good or bad, on YouTube. Um, but what we, what we started to do was to um, host meetups almost, uh, almost a year and a half, two years ago. And from our first meetups, of which there were three, 400 people turned up, they were all very much students, uh, anarchists, devs, um, very much on, on, on the whole kind of cyberpunk type feel to now, and our last meetup had, I think, about almost 500 people there. We had guys from Galaxy Digital, Virgin Ventures. Um, the uh, herd is coming uh, mentality. It's unbelievable to see that the people that have come to our meetups now are all dressed like you gentlemen, all very smart, and they're all from a financial background. We had some guys from Goldman's there. We had guys from Warcap. We had guys from Oxif. We had you know, real smart people that are coming from the financial industry, which two years ago, there wasn't even one of them there. And it's interesting to see that change. But, but also, it's, it's not necessarily, you know, you almost feel a little bit bad about it, because really, it is a tech, it is a technology that's being developed there, and, and it's been a huge problem for, for blockchains to attract good developers that, yeah. that build the technology, um, governance models around that, and, yeah. and how do we incentivize those guys, rather than that, you know, if, if you don't build the technology, like fundamentally, what are you investing into? Yeah. Um, so I do very much believe that, that you know, there needs to be more foc focus on that side of, of blockchain and cryptocurrencies as well. What does it currently look like in, uh, in Holland, Michael? What's the landscape like? Um, what are the people like that are interested in the space? Um, who goes to the meetups? Is it now more of a financial um, industry type, type, type play, or is it still? Um, the people of our companies in the uh, Netherlands are very uh, careful with, with, with uh, doing anything in, the, in these business. You see, I think most, most people that trade are, are retail, and uh, I think due to the lack of any definitive uh, guidelines from, um, from our regulator, it's, it's uh, difficult for, for companies to uh, step into this. Uh, I mean, we, we definitely get a lot of requests, but um, usually they stay uh, with requests, and uh, it seems they were there really uh, careful waiting for uh, more um, definitive answers. And, uh, and what's your current view on um, some of the problems which has happened with regards to uh, theft and you know, crime and, and exchanges being hacked? I mean, how do you kind of view that as you know, as a as a bad actor, as as a you know a negative for the industry. What's your kind of view on on that, Nick? Do you want to kick it off? Yeah, I think it's back back to the point we discussed in the beginning. I think exchanges really are the kind of the, the, the they're the backbone of, of what's happening in terms of trading and, and investing um, right now, at least. And that they're so unregulated really is a problem in my mind. Um, I, I think regulators do need to wake up to that, and you know. What's happening right now, as I said, it's kind of coming in through through back doors where, where these back doors exist. But uh, a more proactive approach, I think, would be quite desirable to to address some of these problems. And you know, it's, it's big money. I mean, what the exchanges make, how much how much assets they hold in custody, um, without kind of a proper regulatory framework, it's pretty unprecedented. If if you think about uh, it's, the it's amount of cryptos the big exchanges sit on, it's quite significant. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, I do know that there's one exchange out there that's probably got about four and a half billion dollars of client money. And um, every few months, they're in a situation that was described to me as, um, it's like trying to hide an elephant in a Wendy house. They have to move the capital around, right? And uh, that's an issue. That's a real issue. But um, I think when you look at exchanges, um, they are in different jurisdictions, and they are 24-7 markets. So. Some of the exchange owners will say, "Well, why should I comply with U.S. regulation? Why should I? Why should I comply when I don't have any U.S. clients 
and I'm based off offshore. Sure, but, but really, I mean, the fact alone that these exchanges are offshore kind of shows that something is lacking onshore, yeah. um, and really be desirable for onshore regulators to, to kind of do something about that. Yeah, the thing, the thing that scares me the most with that is, is counterparty risk, right? So um, if you're a large institution and you want to deposit 50 million, 100 million dollars in exchange because you, 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 know, you need to get trades on or off, and uh, there, are, there are counterparty risk for one day they could be there, and maybe one day they mightn't be there, so. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge barrier to entry, is the, you know, from a counterparty risk perspective. Most of these exchanges are a complete black box as far as, um, you know, their security protocols, their operational, you know, how they're handling client money. Um, so it's very, very difficult for a lot of you know, more serious financial folks to justify getting into, uh, you know, in trading on these exchanges. There's a question over there. Well, yeah, shoot. So you raised a really interesting point around how your meetups went from cipher funds all the way to like finance people. Yeah. And um, I was just in Prague at some like DevCon and all that. And um, what I saw was a lot of very blockchain heavy people trying to like shoehorn blockchain technology into, into finance, right? And who have no appreciation for finance or how the financial world works. Right. And then you've got the other side who are these bankers who've got really no appreciation for how blockchain technology works right. and, or even maybe a passion for it. How do you get those to marry together and kind of force them together to come to a solution that really works. Right? Yeah, like I, I think rather than try to be on the side of the bankers or be on the side of the blockchain people, I think you have to have a solution <laughs> to uh, an existing problem which is better, right? In order for blockchain to be adopted, okay, a decentralized type nature, it has to be better than what we currently have in a centralized system. Like, there can't be any latency, there can't be any delays, there can't be any waiting 15 minutes per block time. Um, we're looking um, at, at several different businesses right now. One is uh, in the ticket sales, uh, one is on the loyalty uh, air miles program, um, and one is on social media where they want to uh, use a blockchain component. And one of those major issues is that unless it's better than a centralized system, then no one's gonna use it. Because not everybody cares about decentralization, not everybody cares about a blockchain. Some people just want to pick up their phone if they're using a DAP, and they just want to do what they want to do. So I think there has to be a compelling case that it's actually better than the system that's there. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't, really, I don't really think we're there yet, but I think the future is happening really fast. And um, I think that um, it, will, it will be very interesting to see um, what large enterprises um, and how they'll take a small proportion of their business and adopt the blockchain. A little bit like back in 92, 93, you had a typical business which had no presence online, and then it had a website, and then the website went to an ordering processing, and then you fast forward that 20 years, and that company doesn't have any storefronts anymore, it's all online. So I think we're really out at the start of that. Um, I don't know if the ICO market last year helped us in any way. I mean. You had 902 ICOs in 2017. By year end, 42% of those ICOs were trading below issue. Um, that figure now is probably more like, it's gone from 42% to probably like 95, and it's gone to 99. I mean, it's difficult when you have uh, an ICO that's gone out and raised, raised capital, and 99% uh, you know, of them have failed. Um, and it's probably, well, what did you expect? I don't think that's going to help it, but um, I think what you're talking about and what I'm talking about is actually large enterprises using blockchain. Has anyone else got any views on yeah, this? Yeah, so I mean, the, the question that you posed about marrying the, the blockchain and the crypto side with the, the you know, traditional finance world, that's exactly the challenge that we face in the market right now, um, just speaking about the market as a whole. Um, so I don't, I don't have an answer for that, but what I will say is that, um, you know, as you said, you know, the kind of the, the finance side is trying to shoehorn crypto into kind of the, the financial mechanisms that exist. Well, you know, blockchain and, and crypto assets are all about innovation and, and disruption. And, you know, if we just take the old model of financial services and, and infrastructure and just plop it on the crypto market, well, that's, that's not very innovative. Um, so I, I think that, that that's the exact challenge that we face. I think there's a lot of, you know, very smart people who are working on innovating solutions to kind of you know, meld those two worlds together and have something make sense, but it's, it's, it's very difficult, and that's, that's kind of what we're seeing, you know, in the market as it develops. 
Nick, have you got a view on that? Um, yeah, I, I think I, I think fundamentally it's quite a difficult one to bridge. Um, I, I think that's, that's what I was trying to say earlier. I mean, this kind of how do I? You know, it's great that capital is coming in, but really, does that capital incentivize the right kind of projects, the right kind of technology development that's happening? And you know, how how does that fit together? And I think what we've seen in 2017, the the whole ICO wave. Um, it was all over the place. Investors need to educate themselves on, on what's going on. Um, and um, yeah, I think projects, blockchain projects out there, they need to you know, do a better job of kind of attracting smart capital that's willing to support them long term. Um, Michael, what does it look like um, from, from your desk, your floor? Um, what's your 10 year? Horizon. What's it going to look like in 10 years? How, how um, are we going to have blockchain adoption? Um, are we all going to be using cryptocurrencies going down to, to Starbucks? Um, how, do you, how do you see this all developing? Give me your 10-year view. And maybe from our perspective, uh, we would uh, start seeing uh, decentralized exchanges. Um, it would take away the risk that we, we currently see with all the, all the current exchanges, is the, the exchange risk. Um, and you won't have the yeah, risk that uh, all your money uh, is lost by uh, some hack. Um, on a broader scale, it's maybe that we need to find, um, I think the, the larger enterprises need to start using um, the, the blockchain technology. If, if for example, um, um, big companies like uh, Microsoft, Apple start uh, uh, accepting Bitcoin as a payment is probably not the best uh, payment method for that, but uh, then you can start, I think, seeing that uh, people will uh, use uh, blockchain in uh, the everyday uh, use. Uh, Nick, what does it look like, uh, your view, 10 years from now? Um, yeah, d difficult to say. <laughs> It's, uh, I think there's still quite a lot to be done on, on, on the technology side, and in terms of adoption, it's, it's really lacking right now. I mean, it's, we are still in a phase where, where it's about, about investment and speculation. And again, I think I would like to draw this parallel to venture capital investment. A lot of money is flowing into the space, um, and it's not quite clear yet what, what, will, you know, what will be the situation five years, ten years down the line. Um, and of course, ideally, things will play out in a way that, that you know, some cryptocurrency does become a widely adopted means of payment, for example, um, a store of value. All these things are being discussed, but it's right now all still quite hypothetical, and I think this technology um, gap we still need to bridge. Lucas, uh, are you and I still going to be here, or are we going to have to go get real jobs? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we'll still be here. I mean, I think that you know what I'll say is it's it's difficult enough to figure out you know what's going to happen next week in in this world, and you know let alone ten years. Um, and I'm a markets guy. I'm not going to pretend to be a tech guy. So I'll speak to the market side. I think that this, as I said previously today, um, you know this asset class is going to look like every other you know financial market um, in future. I don't know if it's going to be in three years or five years or one year, but I, I believe, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think it's going to get there and, and we're definitely seeing things being built, um, you know, to that tune. Right. Uh, there was a question from a gentleman there. Maybe we'll have some questions and then I think we're pretty much going to wrap it up. This is a question predominantly geared towards Nick. Um, it sounds as though you have some frustrations around a bottleneck in technology development and perhaps investment which hasn't been shaped and geared in the appropriate fashion towards that. Um, what needs to change in order for that to happen and occur in the years going forwards? Um, well, I, I think it could just be that it is, by its very nature, uh, something that takes some time. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that will happen overnight. I think a lot of people underestimate the kind of complexity involved with um, you know, you know how, how blockchains operate, how do, how do the consensus mechanisms operate, kind of this whole proof of work, energy wastage is, is something that's being discussed for Bitcoin. Can, can we find a solution that's, that's better on that front? Big problem. Big problem, huge problem, right? And um, so there is projects out there that are working on that. Um, so, I mean, Ethereum has, has started playing around with proof of stake. Um, there is proof of space uh, uh, ideas out there where you're basically using... Uh, instead of processing power, you're using um, your hard disk space um, to kind of incur a cost. 
Um, because in the end, that's how consensus works. You, you need to incur a cost, so other members of the network can penalize you if you approve fraudulent transactions. Um, so there's a lot of good ideas out there, and I think it's really about the, the ecosystem, the capital that's coming in, being allocated to the right projects that are bringing forward kind of really innovative solutions that, that make sense. Um, because, again, you've seen a lot of fraudulent activity out there or simply crazy ideas that were never going to work in the first place. Um, and I think it is, it is about education, spreading the word, and, and getting the right kind of people, you know, the next generation of developers involved. Um, I think Ethereum, for example, had this bizarre problem that so many of the early guys who, who um, mm. coded on it and developed it, they got so crazy rich of it, they just retired, and, and that's it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so it's, it's, it's all a bit choppy, but I think um, give it another five or ten years, I think there's probably a lot more to come. Um, so I think in the long run, I'm actually quite quite positive. So I didn't mean to, I didn't want to sound sound negative, and in, 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 you know, not at all. I think for for me, the writing's on the wall. Like it's it's obvious. Like it's such a layup trade. If you've got a long ten year view on this, like you would have to be absolutely batshit crazy to not be deploying capital into the space. It's just, it's it, it's obvious what's happening. Um, and I think there's lots of different investment themes. And uh, yeah, for for us, I mean, we are uh, you know we're we're all in. 100%. Um, any other questions? Gentlemen. Thanks. You've talked about uh, the difficulty of working with centralized exchanges and the counterparty risk associated with it. You also mentioned in the beginning that uh, it's important to invest in the technology. Why do you think decentralized exchanges have, haven't seen a, a lot of investment and are not as widely used as maybe they should be? So there's, there's one huge thing, and I, I will say I will preface it with um, if you look at decentralized exchange volume, uh, volumes have been trending up as far as market share. So I mean, it, they are becoming a little bit more you know, uh, prolific in the market. That said, they're still a very, very small part of the market. Uh, the number one thing is the KYC issue. Um, there's, no, there's no way to tell who you're trading with on the other side. Um, I know there's a lot of people trying to solve for that for using decentralized exchanges, but I don't think we'll see uh, mainstream adoption of decentralized exchanges until that happens because for um, you know, the flows to move to a decentralized exchange model, I, I think that institutions are going to be what's going to drive that. And so you know, no institution is going to be comfortable with uh, trading on a decentralized exchange when they you know, don't know if they're trading with you know, a, a drug dealer on the other side or, or whoever it might be. Okay, well on that rather positive note, I think we'll uh, give a big round of applause for the panelists. Thank you all so much for your time. Michael, Rudas, and Nick, thank you very much, gentlemen.